depending on how it goes. Um, we're going to wrap some things up about layout today, about the fixed layout that we, we uh, developed last time. So we'll wrap that up today. I want to go back and review a few things about images and directories, because that seems to be something consistently that uh, people are running into difficult, difficulty in when they turn in their labs. So I, I do want to spend a minute reviewing that. Um, I want to talk about accessibility, and I want to talk about more flexible layouts. Um, I don't know if we'll get to all four of these things this week or not. We'll kind of play it by ear and see how we, how, how we go and, and, and go from there. All right. Um, the first thing I want to do is I want to take um, the layout that we were working on last week for our template and, and say a few things about it. And then take and create a second CSS file that will take the exact same HTML and style it way differently. All right? That's an important notion with CSS is that by having the content and the presentation separate, we have a lot more flexibility in changing one without affecting the other. So let's refresh our memory and let's look at what we had last week. What I did today is I created a folder called Fixed A and Fixed B. Fixed A is the original one that we started with last time. Actually, so is Fixed B, all right, because they're just one's just a copy of the other. But Fixed B, we're going to go and change to make it look different um, later on today. All right, let's pull up Fixed A. And we had a layout that looked like this. Again, you know, not perfect, not earth shattering, but definitely not bad. Um, the navigation is set aside so that we can see clearly the different pages that we can get to. It has a consistent look and feel. All the pages look the same. Um, and um, in general, you know, not a, not a bad, albeit a pretty simple layout. Um, we did this with what's called fixed positioning. If we were to look at the CSS file, we'll notice that we are specifying absolute numbers for widths, heights, position. We're specifying a certain number of pixels for the width of these different elements. We're specifying um, different um, absolute numbers for the padding. The position, we're specifying certain number of pixels from the top, certain number of pix pixels from the left, and defining a position of absolute. This we jokingly call as an ice layout or a frozen layout because it doesn't matter what you do to this window, that layout stays the same. These are probably the simplest kind of layout that you can have, all right? But the downside is, is that um, it doesn't really respond to the user's uh, environment, which means that, and I'm not sure how this will show up on the projector, so I'll, I'll take a shot. If we go and change the screen resolution, something like that. I think we'll, have, we'll get the idea. We'll notice that our web page really only takes up about half the screen now, whereas before it sort of came closer to filling the screen. On a big enough monitor, this, this kind of layout will end up almost looking like a postage stamp, right? It'll be up in the, up in the corner and uh, because it doesn't change size. It doesn't change size based on how big the window is. It doesn't change size based on how big the user's screen is. All right? So it, it's fixed. It's frozen. It, it's not flexible at all. Um, this has the advantage of being simple. This has the advantage of being pretty well sure that we can guarantee that the page is going to look the same on different platforms. All right? 
Some of the more elaborate ones, if you go to CSSN Garden, are fixed because that's a very specific layout. They want to look exactly like that, and they want it fixed like that. Now, notice I went, and as we resize this, the text gets bigger along with it. Um, there's a couple ways that you can you can resize the text on a page depending on the browser you use. Let's open this up in Internet Explorer. Actually, let's go back to our original settings on this first. And now let's go and open up one of these pages in Internet Explorer. Depending on how you resize the text, uh, it's possible for the text to uh, actually leak out of a area that we have it designated for. We may have talked about it this week, or last week rather, because it looks like I fixed that. All right. Um, let's look at the CSS file. And sure enough, I did. I've given a specific font size for these things. I've said like 18 pixel for the font size of this, uh, 10 pixel, oh no, that's the padding, and so on. Um, it is possible, depending on how you resize it, to have the text leak out. So again, uh, if, that's, if that's a concern, you can make the font size an absolute. Uh, that may make it uh, harder for people to resize the page, but again, you get the, the benefit of, of knowing that uh, everything's going to look the same and, and constant. Um, so essentially, this is a fixed layout. All right. What we all want to do now is we want to take this layout and make a second version of this site by only changing the CSS. Now, that's sort of the acid test, right? Uh, the promise of CSS is that I can do whatever I want to to change the layout of the page, and I shouldn't have to change the HTML at all. all right? That's sort of our goal. If we can do that, then we've done a good job separating the presentation and the content of the page. So that's what our, our goal is going to be. All right? Now, let's look at some of the things that we can change. Um, some of these things we probably have talked about. Some of these things we might not have talked about. Um, we can change the position of these items, which is one thing that we can do. We can certainly change the color schemes. We can add background images. All right. We can add borders. We can change the orientation of things. In other words, these links are oriented vertically. We can actually change those to be oriented horizontally. All right. And that's all things that we're going to do in our second alternative layout. So let's go into that folder. Right now it's the same as our first layout. But in short work, we're going to go and edit the CSS file, and only edit the CSS file, to make this page look completely different. What we're going to look for, what we're going to aim for, is a layout that looks like this. If I'm going to sketch out the wireframe, we'll have our navigation on top. I didn't want to make that that big. I'll separate it. Then we'll have our banner. And then we'll have our content area, which is different from how it's situated now, where we have banner. navigation, and content area. All right. So that's our aim. So my first step I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of all the style code. All right. So we're kind of back to square one with this one. 
we were to look at this page, we'll see a completely unstyled page. All right. I'm going to slowly add the style code back in. And in contrast to our fall orange colored uh, scheme before, we're going to do, because today's a real gray day, we're going to do a monochromatic, uh, very gray um, page. All right. First thing I want is I want the navigation to be on top. Which, again, if you look at the HTML, in the HTML it's not in that order, right? We have our banner, then our navigation, and the content. But remember, with CSS we can do whatever we want. So what I'm going to do is go into the style sheet, and I'm going to set a style rule for the navigation. Pound sign nav. A top of... 10 pixels, a bottom, no, not a bottom, a left of 10 pixels, let's say, position absolute, we'll give it a width of we're going to nudge our way into being more flexible by giving relative widths. All right? So I'm going to give this a width of 80%. And I'll give it a height of 100 pixels. And we can play around with it to see if we like it. I will give a background color of Pound sign, three, 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 and a text of white. I'm also going to go in, I'm going to give, for all my links in the nav section, I'm going to give a color of white. and a background of a little bit lighter gray. Sound sign. So let's let, take a look at this and see what we have. All right. Hmm. Those links are oriented vertically still. We don't want them to be vertically. We want them to be uh, horizontally. Let's take a look at the HTML code behind there. And in the HTML code, it's a unordered list. Unordered lists by default stack vertically. The list items stack vertically. But as I said before, with CSS, we can change virtually any aspect of the appearance. How do we change the aspect of the appearance? Uh, to make it stack horizontally instead of vertically. Well, if you remember, there's two kinds of tags. There are block tags and inline tags. All right. One of them stacks on top of each other. One of them stacks horizontally. Which one stacks on top of each other? The block tags do. The block tags simply stack one on top of the other. So really, what we want to do is we want to change the li tags instead of block tags, to be inline tags. And we can do that this way, by saying, in my nav section, <clears throat> I want my LIs to have a display type of inline. Let's lighten up the color on that a little bit more. And there we go. The links are now oriented horizontally, all right, across the page. Now, we're moving in the right direction, but we're not really there yet, right? Um, I would want these to be um, spaced out a little bit. All right, have a little, put a little bit of space between them. And I might want to make them bigger. 
and I might want to center the whole block inside of there. And I want to get rid of those bullet points, which we can't see, but I want to get rid of them anyhow. So the bullet points we talked about last time we can get rid of by saying pound sign nav ul list style type none. Again, to review what these means, pound sign nav means the things on the page that have an ID of nav. The A then says any link tag that is in an HTML tag that has an ID of nav. So we're not going to affect all the links on the page, just the links in the navigation section. Now how can I put spaces between those? Yeah, I can put padding or margin, really. Let's put some padding on the link and say padding of, let's say, five pixels. And let's see what that looks like. The li the, by the way, we weren't seeing the bullet points before because it was just a, a, a dark bullet point on a dark background. So now they're going to be gone altogether. All right, and we put some, we, we put some padding on it. And that kind of did what we wanted to. That put some space between the border or the edge of the link and the text, but we still don't have any space between the text. How can we get some space between the text of the link? Well, between items, there's a margin. So I could say mar for nav li, give a margin of 20 px, let's say. All right, and that puts some space in between them. All right, how do you suppose I can center this so that this whole block is centered there, as opposed to now it's sort of skewed to the one side? Text align. Now, what am I going to put the text align style on? Well, I could put it on the body, all right, but that would hit everything, all right. But I only want, really at this point I only want the navigation so I'll just put it on the on the nav. So text align center. All right, and we're moving in the right direction. Now, I don't like the fact that um, the links are different sizes. All right, that doesn't look neat to me. All right. How could we make the links all have the same size? Yeah. Put in spaces won't work, remember, because any single space um, is uh, implemented, or any multiple spaces are, are simply changed to one space, white space, if you remember that back from before. So we can't really do that. Now you can do a, uh, the closest that you can come to what you're describing is you could put in an ampersand NDSP. And, but the problem with that is it's on different screens with different fonts, that won't even out. There, there's a better, uh, simpler, more, uh, more, more foolproof sort of way. How can we make all those have the same width? Well, no, the padding will, will simply, right now the padding of all of those are the same, right? We could increase the padding of these to 15 pixels, let's say. And they have more padding on them, but again, the word bio is still shorter than interesting links. How can we make those have all the same width? We define a width attribute for it. Now, in a way, this is a trick question, right? Because if I do this, with, let's say, 100 pixels, actually nothing happened. It's a trick question because 
you can only set widths on block tags. All right, you can't set widths on an inline tag. So, there's sort of a trick that you can do here. I still want these A tags to behave as inline tags, but I can just say display block-inline. And what it will do is it will still be an inline tag, but it will allow you to put in some of the characteristics of a block tag. So it's kind of like it's both at the same time. So now if we do that, There we go. It's inline block, not block inline. Now that's a little too wide, so let's let's narrow these down a little bit. All right. There we go. Looks pretty good. We can play with this, and we can even give an effect to look like a button by being clever with how we play with the borders. Let's go and look up borders on the W3C site. W3C, W3 school site, I mean. There's an inset and an outset border. Well, let's try this. Border. Five pixels. Outset white. All right, they look like that. Now, I can go and give a style rule for the hover pseudo class. change the border type to inset, and maybe change the background color to make it a little lighter. <laughs> and sort of that gives sort of a buttony kind of effect. You could actually do a little more with that if you wanted to by putting a background image of that. Um, in fact, if you go on websites, they'll, they'll give you a background image for a, a mouse over and, and a regular link background image. You can, you can find buttons on a number of different websites. But it's nice to see how you can sort of create a button kind of effect simply by setting the hover style to change the border and to change the background color. I want to do a couple more things with this before I call it a day. I want to get rid of those underlines.
and I want to make the font a little bit bigger. Let's see what that does. And I want to make the, the fonts of this page sans serif fonts. So I'll say body. Font family. Arial. Helvetica. Font serif. There we go. All right, let's look at this in review, make sure everyone understands what I did. Font family, again, changes the font on the page. Why do I have three fonts listed there? I don't have just one font, I have three fonts. Ariel's a font, Helvetica's a font, and Sans Serif is a font family, I guess you'd call it. Right, exactly. Different machines have different fonts loaded. Um, for example, um, Microsoft doesn't have Helvetica, which is probably, it's the only font that I'm aware of that was the subject of a feature film. All right, go, any of you have Netflix, look up Helvetica. All right, there's a movie, a documentary about the invention of the font Helvetica, and it's actually pretty interesting. Um, Ariel is sort of Microsoft's uh, version of Helvetica. Uh, they didn't want to pay for the licensing fee, so they made one that looks a lot like it. All right. Sans Serif is sort of the generic font. Uh, in other words, virtually every machine is either going to have the Ariel or Hel the Helvetica font, but on the odd chance that there's a machine that doesn't, it should have a generic Sans Serif font. Have we talked about what a serif is and what Sans Serif means? Serifs are the little thingy doos on the end of letters. So, for example, you might see an A look like that. These things are called serifs. Sans serif simply means without serifs. So, an A in a sans serif font would look more like that with none of these little thingies on the end. Um, you can go back and forth about what is more readable. Um, on, a, on a computer screen, especially for smaller type, um, sans serif is probably more readable. All right. Um, for headlines, um, oftentimes uh, serif works uh, good. So oftentimes you'll see things like maybe the headings of a page are in, sans, are in serif font and the individual uh, the, the, the articles itself are in uh, sans serif. If we go to the Wall Street Journal, I'm almost positive that's how their site is set up. If you look, there the little H has the thingy do's on it, so that is a serif font, but the actual text of the article is done in sans serif. That's generally speaking a, uh, a pretty good strategy for, uh, for fonts. All right, a lot, of, a lot of places do that. There's nothing wrong with just using one set of fonts per page, by the way. You know, don't think that you have to use multiple fonts, but if you're going to mix fonts, serif for headings, sans serif for body of, of, of the page is, is probably a, a pretty good strategy. All right.
Any questions about anything that I did so far? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's sort of a, 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 a fake 3D effect. Um, if you go in and look in, if we look at the style for a border, they show all the different possibilities for it. Uh, we've been using solid most of the time, but there's also dashed and dotted and double and groove and ridge. And then there's an inset and an outset. And the inset or, or the outset to me looks like the button is out, coming out from the screen. The inset looks sort of like the button has been pressed and has gone into the screen. You know, it's you know, it's it's it's, it's an effect. It it uh, in the right situation it can look reasonably good. One last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make the color black here when we put our mouse over this. There we go. I think that looks better. Also going to make the Also, I'm going to make the, the navigation section a little shorter. Let's make it 80 pixels. Oops. Yeah, that looks a little better to me. All right, now I want the headings to be uh, underneath it. I want the, the, the page banner to be underneath that. So what I'll do is I'll go into CSS here, and I will set a style for the banner. That will have a left of 10 pixels, just like the other one does. A top of, and we could calculate all this, uh, let's say a top of um, 90 pixels, and also a width of 100%. And let's give it a background of that. All right. should be 80%. I wanted it to match that. And I forgot to say position absolute. That is one thing I just absolutely have a mental block on. When I'm doing absolute positions, I always forget the, the position absolute um, part of the style rule. So now we have our banner looking like that. How do you suppose we could get the H1 and H2 to line up next to each other? Well, we use a display attribute to get a block tag and change it into an inline tag. So we probably can do that strategy again. And I could say banner H1 display inline. Banner 
H2 display inline. All right. Hmm. Might want to put some space in there. Well, that's fine. We can go in and we can say. margin 20px and we could play around with that to get it exactly the way that we like we actually could go and do this and say Font size twelve PX and make the color of this white. Okay, maybe that's a little too small. Size 22 pixels. All right, kind of getting to where we like it. We'll leave it at that. You can actually, by the way, in addition to pixels, you can say a point size. Point size is like uh, coming from the old world of uh, printing presses and all that. Now, you might say, gee, he just made the H1s and H2s the same size. That's true. Remember, the size of H1s being bigger than H2s is simply the default behavior of the browser. We can change that to be any way we want to. We can designate that H1s are a different color. We can designate them as being a different font. There's a lot of things we can do to um, change uh, and designate that one's a top level header, one's a secondary level header. All right. I'm going to go and I'm going to put in a style rule here in the banner section to give a different set of fonts To do what I suggested before, making my headers in a serif font. All right. Lastly, let's go and let's set the content area of this guy. All right, there we go. Make this a little darker. Let's make this a little lighter. So 
okay, let's make it, let's put it back to where it was. All right, so as we were, would add content to this, this would turn out to be not a bad looking page, all right? And if we notice, we have not edited any of the HTML at all, and yet we've really made it look radically different. Um, were we to have more time, we could put a background image on the, um, uh, you know, uh, on the body or on the H1. Uh, or on the banner section, or whatever, and really make it look even even more different than um, than than what we have. Questions about this? Key points to understand about what we've gone over the last day or so, or the last class or so. Number one. The way that we can do selectors, we've enhanced that in this example. In the first so many weeks of the semester, all our selectors were simply HTML tags. So it would say, make every link on the page look this way. Make every H1 on the page look this way. Make every paragraph look this way. Now we're able to fine tune it a little bit. And we're able to fine tune it by saying, all right, I don't want everything on the page to look this way. I just want everything with a certain ID to look this way. So, for example, this style rule, the selector is the thing that has an ID of nav. All right, so the thing that has an ID of nav gets this style rule. And that corresponds to this section here. All right. We can then mix and match between the HTML and the IDs in this manner, by saying the things that have an ID of nav, all the A's inside of those, so all the A's inside the thing on the page that has an ID of nav gets this rule. All right? We've explored some new attributes with CSS. The width, the height, the border, the padding, and the position, the top and the left, and position absolute so that we can nail things down on a page. Now this is a very rigid format. All right, as we change our window size, the page doesn't change. This second example does change a little bit because I gave a relative width. I said a width of 80% instead of saying a width of you know, 600 pixels or something. So as this page gets bigger or smaller, actually some interesting things happen. And that's a problem. So let's go and change this to be a width of 800 pixels. And we'll change all of the widths. That's the exact sort of problem that you run into when you start introducing relative sizes of things, is that as you change the screen, the layout may change a little bit. Now, I don't really feel like going in and, and going through to fix that so it doesn't do that. So I'm going to take the easy way out and just give it a fixed size of 800 pixels. So now we're back to the fixed where that page doesn't move. Questions about this? Yes. So, nav and the hover, mm -hmm. that only takes effect when the mouse is over? Correct. Otherwise? Exactly. And, and there's a whole set of these that you can put in in addition to uh, link, which we can do this, a link, which is just the basic default for it. There's also hover, there's also visited, and there's also active. So there's four of them. And they need to be in a certain sequence. If you look in the other example, I, I, I show the, the sequence that those need to be in. You had a question.
No, not really. Um, well, I'd have to look at that specifically. A uh, hover is really only when the mouse is over it. Um, when you use the different methods, you do need to put them in the proper sequence for it to work the way that you'd expect it to. Um, link, visited, hover, active. So it's possible, I don't know, we would have to look to see exactly what, what your particular thing um, is doing. Okay, word on images. All right, I want to spend a couple minutes uh, reviewing images. First of all, all right, in fact, let's go and find a Creative Commons image. I'll tell you what. Well, we'll grab Elsie's image. I'm sure they will not object to me using it here. All right. So, here's that image, maybe. Okay. There's that image, and it has a certain size. All right. This is a GIF file, which if you notice, a GIF file allows for transparency. So that's one thing that's nice about a GIF file. I could go and add this to one of the pages. Let's go and add that to the index page. Couple of things. First of all, Every image needs two attributes. A source attribute that says the name of the file that you're using. And the second one is an alt attribute, which is a verbal description of the image that's used in case the image can't display and it's also used for accessibility purposes. And we'll talk about accessibility probably later on uh, this week. So there's the logo. Now, let's say I don't like the logo this big. All right. What you can do, but I, I urge you not to do it, is to go in and um, specify a height and width right on the image, or even via the CSS. I never use the HTML or CSS to size the image. What I do instead is I'll simply edit the image to make it the size that I want it. So let's say I want this to be a quarter of the size that it currently is. I'll use some uh, image editing software to go and edit it. So I would avoid you resizing it there. Why do I say that? Because if you resize it via the HTML attributes, you still have a certain size of the image. If it's a megabyte image, one megabyte image, you're still forcing the user to download a megabyte even if you just make it tiny. All right. So therefore, make the image the size that you want it to be as opposed to using the HTML to do it. And again, there's a lot of editors that you can use to do that. The absolute simplest one in Windows would be Paint. And we'll go in and I can make it 50%, 50%.
and then I can save it, and then I get the image smaller. All right. Now, one thing. Always keep an original of your image because you can't now go and expand that image that I changed, right? Because it would become pixelated or distorted. I've lost information by sizing it. Now, here's another thing. If I want to put it in another folder, which a lot of you, or, or many of you did, but some of you didn't, what you need to do then is specify the name of the folder, the relative path to that image. In other words, if I'm in this folder and the image is in a folder underneath it called image, I don't have to put this complete path in here. In fact, that won't work at all. All right. Likewise, if I'm doing links from pages to page, I don't put that in there as part of the path. That will only work on your machine with your directories. Instead, I use a relative path. Notice, for example, that all these links, since all these pages are in the same folder, all I say is the file name. Now, in this case, since I moved the image to a folder called image, I can just say image slash logo, and I don't need to put in that C, blah, 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 blah. That won't work on any machine other than yours. So you need to use what's called the relative path. In other words, how do you get to that image from your page? Well, that page is above the image. The image is in a folder called image, and therefore I would put image that. Now, if you get more involved and go up and down, you, you can use dot, dot, and all that, and I can talk about that individually. But I do want to review this with you. You know, going forward, a few things will be a good practice. Always use an external CSS file. Keep your images in a file called image, or a folder called images, and that will kind of make your project a little cleaner. Then you just zip everything up and upload it. All right. Um, if you have questions about this, let's address them individually. Again, many of you are already doing this, but for some of you, there still seems to be a little bit of an issue with it. So let's address those issues individually. All right, I will zip up and uh, post this to Angel, then I'll be upstairs uh, in lab. See you there.